What you're about to see is 100% non-corporatized activist news, and we depend on patrons to keep us acting out. So to become a patron of the show, visit patreon.com slash actout. This week on Act Out, cryptocurrency, a hot issue shrouded in mystery for many. And as Bitcoin climbs and then falls, the list of questions and concerns only seems to get longer. So first up, we'll revisit some Bitcoin basics, and next we'll add to the conversation and dive deeper with Bitcoin expert Andreas Antonopoulos. Prepare to stretch your mind and reshape how you think of money and the systems that control it. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is Act Out. Welcome to Act Out. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your tipping point. Bitcoin, the shadowy electronic currency that soars and dives, is accepted at seemingly random underground punk stores and cozy diners alike. Buy some, it's a good investment. Don't buy, it's a bubble. Holy shit, it's up. Oh my god, it's down. It's elitist. No, it's for everyone. How the hell does it work, and why do I have to remember this ridiculous phrase to get into my digital wallet? Yes. Bitcoin suffers from endless waves of chaotic murmurings that leave many people shaking their heads in confusion. A couple of years ago, in episode 35 in fact, we had Bitcoin and cryptocurrency expert Andreas Antonopoulos on the show to lay down some Bitcoin basics. And while I do recommend you watch it, the basic gist, as noted by Andreas, is this. Cryptocurrency is internet money. It's money without banks, without governments. It's network-centric and based on the internet, kind of like email is communication without the post office. No one has direct control of cryptocurrencies. It's uncensorable. Transactions are confirmed and stored in a shared public ledger known as blockchain. Bitcoin is one iteration, but there are thousands of cryptocurrencies that use the same decentralized model. So that's the basic, very basic rundown of cryptocurrencies. There's a much deeper alleys and rabbit holes to go down, for instance, the fact that you could use blockchain technology for so much more than just currency. But for this episode, for right now, we're going to focus on Bitcoin. Last week, Bitcoin hit a rocky spot, dropping below 10,000 for the first time since November of 2017. Along with other cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin dropped as China and South Korea prepare to escalate recent measures to discourage use of cryptocurrencies. Authorities plan to effectively shut off access to online services that allow people to trade Bitcoin by blocking wallet services and access to exchange websites. What? A centralized government that depends on a centralized capitalist machine to extract resources for pithy payments to the many and huge profits to the few is threatened by a decentralized currency completely detached from bank or government ownership? Well, I never. And yet, Bitcoin is no stranger to highs or lows. Some of you may recall that Bitcoin shot up to nearly 20,000 in mid-December. And if we look at January of 2017, it was barely scraping 1,000. So what does it all mean? Do we embrace cryptocurrencies as the powers that be see them as a threat to their economic monopoly? Do we invest with the hopes that Bitcoin can bring us to the other side of capitalism? Tackling these questions and others, we are once again joined by Bitcoin expert, author, and speaker, Andreas Antonopoulos. Take a look. I think we're in a bubble of exuberance. Um, that has nothing to do with the underlying technology. That's just the, and in fact, I think many of the people who are investing in Bitcoin right now or in other cryptocurrencies probably understand very little about how these things work or why they matter, and they're just chasing riches. Um, we have to be realistic about that. Now, of course, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies are not the only bubble around. In fact, they're probably the least risky, least interesting, uh, and yet most talked about bubble. Nobody's talking about the bonds bubble or the real estate bubble or the equities bubble or the debt bubble because those would pose uncomfortable political questions. So everybody wants to talk about the Bitcoin bubble. And you know, I you probably remember uh, in 2000s uh, the internet bubble 
And when that finally burst, and of course, we all stopped using the internet um, <laughs> after that. So, I mean, again, it's important to separate here the underlying technology and platform. Bitcoin isn't a stock. Um, it's not an index. It's a technology, first and foremost. It has an exchange rate, has a currency, but that's not the most interesting thing. That's probably the least interesting thing. So one of the things I, I saw a, a talk that you gave where you're talking about uh, money being data, um, which to me, I, I sort of think of it that way on Wall Street as well, because they're not actually trading money. They're trading ones and zeros. It's all inside the computer anyway. The difference being that Bitcoin is, is uh, this decentralized form of that data. But if we see, and I, I've, I've heard that there are these big corporations that are, you know, like JP Morgan is investing in cryptocurrencies now. If we see the same sort of thing happen with cryptocurrencies that we've seen with real money, that, uh, that the people that can buy a lot of it do buy a lot of it, and there's that, that sort of like inequality that grows, does, do, does the cryptocurrency or does Bitcoin maintain that sort of decentralized, more populist perspective, or does that change it and make it look more like traditional money? Well, yes, um, I think it's important to separate decentralization of control and decentralization of ownership, right? Um, the, the thing is, what Bitcoin offers is, yes, it's, it's a form of data and it's ones and zeros, but it's very different from the ones and zeros you have in the traditional banking system or the traditional stock markets. In the traditional banking system and stock markets, the one and zeros represent debt that is owed by the bank to you under a very strict sort of uh, set of circumstances. And so the ones and zeros refer to an entry in their database that they control single-handedly. And you don't actually own anything. You have a promissory note. So you have an account. Um, and in fact, you don't have a claim on the money you put in the bank. What's decentralized about Bitcoin is that the zero ones you're transmitting are not debt and they're not somebody else's database. They're an entry that shows the assets that you control personally in the database that everybody owns, but no one controls, which is the Bitcoin blockchain, which is shared by everyone. No one has control, so no one can seize those ones and zeros. No one can freeze those ones and zeros. And you always have a claim as long as you control the keys to those ones and zeros. So yes, it is digital money, but it's a very different form of digital money. And the thing that's decentralized is the control. Now, that doesn't mean the ownership is decentralized. That doesn't mean that everybody owns a little piece of this. In fact, quite the opposite. What we've seen over time uh, is the emergence of, of Pareto equilibrium, as it's called in, in statistics and economics, which is the 80-20 rule, 20% <laughs> control 80%, right? And these kinds of imbalances, these are the natural outcome of processes where those who have an early advantage can build on that advantage and make it bigger and bigger over time. It's the rich get richer, uh, but also the most popular authors become even more popular authors faster. The biggest Twitter accounts get more followers every month. You know, the biggest singers get more, um, more albums out, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, uh, I I do want to talk I do want to talk a little bit about that um, that issue of like who has access to it because uh, one of the things that um, one of the things that you mentioned on on your Twitter account was if you want to see something happen in Bitcoin then start coding testing writing documentation you are the they that you've been looking for and with the with the concept of cryptocurrencies. Uh, the problem is that if you if there's that digital inequity, for example, that people in marginalized communities oftentimes don't have access to the internet or or don't have access to you know a, a phone that has the ability to have a, like a wallet on it or something like that. So this sort of uh, digital inequity is yet another door that closes in front of people that would like to access this new form of currency. Is there a way out of that in terms of the of, of the future of cryptocurrency, or would, will we just see the continuation of that sort of uh, inequality? Well, it, you know, crypto doesn't magically solve humanity's problems. Um, the, the question is whether some of those inequalities are also rooted in the ability or centralization of control over money. 
and control over banking services. Because the truth is that the same, many of the same uh, minorities that have no access to smartphones and computers also have no access to bank accounts because they can't open one. They don't have access to identity documents in order to open a bank account or vote or many of the other things that propagate inequality. In the case of banks, uh, though, the fact that that money is not theirs to control, even if they do have a bank account, only tends to heighten these inequalities. And so, one, in order to solve inequality and in access to finance, the, the, the way to do that in the traditional system is to somehow lobby politicians to pass laws to change the way banks function and banks are regulated in order to open opportunity for more people. That hasn't worked. The Bitcoin approach is to, is to um, basically look at the evolution of technology and notice that things like smartphones, for example, have been dropping in price for the same model or capability by about half every two years, Moore's Law, um, the technological evolution and the economies of scale, which means that the type of cell phone that only a rich person had in the 1980s and, and 1990s you can find in the most remote rural areas in the world. And you know your average Kenyan farmer has a cell phone. They don't have an Android smartphone yet, uh, but they do have a cell phone. And if you ask someone in the 90s, if the cell phone would move from the hands of Gordon Gecko into the hands of a Kenyan farmer, the answer would, would have been, no, that's not possible. They're too expensive. We now have transmission of Bitcoin transactions of satellite feeds, which means you don't need an internet connection. You can do it with, uh, you know, a satellite dish that's the same one that's used for TV in many regions of the world, including the vast majority of Africa is now covered. Um, so rather than lobbying, using technology and the deflationary effect of technology to broaden reach, I think is a more promising approach. Of course, you know, I'm a geek. I would think that. So let's talk because you you know you're, you're talking about lobbying politicians and politics. Let's talk about politics because currently the U.S. dollar is the reserve currency, and we go to war with nations that threaten to pull away from the petrodollar. For for instance, uh, could pet, could cryptocurrencies be the sort of like Helen of Troy that launches like a thousand American warships because it it could potentially pull people away from the petrodollar or from this. This uh, what is now currently set in stone is the reserve currency being the U.S. dollar. Absolutely, I mean the currency wars are already happening and they're only going to heat up. And it has nothing to do with cryptocurrencies. It has everything to do with the fact that the existing currencies are now saddled with so much debt that the only way to get out of it is to massively inflate the currency, trashing its value. And but the problem is if you inflate your currency and your neighbor inflates their currency faster. On average, you end up effectively not inflating your currencies. Then you have to do another round and another round. These currency wars have now been happening really since the 2009 crisis, 2008 crisis, and they're accelerating. Um, you know, I remind those who watch my seminars to just keep repeating in their head and, and maybe even out loud, we didn't start the fire. <laughs> And the, the thing about Bitcoin is that, okay, you launch 100 warships. The problem is, what do you bomb? Uh, and there's nothing to bomb. Um, the same equipment that's used for Bitcoin is also used for everything else, communications, computers, cell phones, satellite dishes. There is no central location that you can bomb. There is no foxhole that you can drop a deep penetrating munition on a cave and take out the central Bitcoin server because there is no central Bitcoin server. In the currency wars, what that means is there's now a currency that cannot be embargoed, uh, sanctioned, or intimidated into going away or stopping to threaten reserve status, which only makes that currency, or the set of currencies that have those characteristics, much more appealing to play geopolitics with. A neutral currency is an incredibly valuable thing. The fact that no one controls it means that people can trust it because they know it's not part of somebody else's geopolitical strategy. So let's talk about uh, other cryptocurrencies because uh, what what seems interesting to me is that there are there are all these different forks and there's all this like there's Bitcoin Cash which is different from Bitcoin. There's Ethereum. There's like there's like it seems like every day there is new cryptocurrencies and I'm wondering like could it and 
could it get to the point where everybody has their like I have Eleanor coin or what have you? Like, is there is there an end to this? Does there need to be an end to this? It it seems like it's just a little hard to wrap my head around just the creation of perpet the perpetual creation of new cryptocurrencies. How does that how does that work and how does that sustain itself in this new commerce paradigm? Um, very simply, it it doesn't in that. Um, it, it doesn't end. And yes, absolutely, you can and probably will have uh, Eleanor coin at some point. And, and the reason for that is because money is fundamentally a language that allows us to express affiliation, and we use it for social purposes all of the time. We use it to build social bonds and commerce, but also to give to friends and family and to support each other, et cetera, et cetera. It's not a zero-sum game. They're not dividing a pie. It's not about competition with each other. It's about subjective value that sometimes has nothing to do with economic value. There will be some people who, despite the fact that Eleanor Coin may be commercially unviable, but to your friends, it's very important because it allows them to express support for your work. For example, it can be used in the way that for, for many Patreon is used today to have a direct connection between artists and their audience. So, you know, people get confused about this. Uh, how do I know which one is real? How do I know which one is authoritative? How do I know which one has value? A very similar questions were asked in the very beginning of the web uh, when bloggers started appearing. And then the question said, well, I mean, until now, I would read the New York Times or the Washington Post, and I know they have authoritative truth. Um, how do I know which bloggers to trust and what happens when anyone can blog and anyone can have an opinion. We don't even know which opinion is authoritative. Well, exactly. And we ended up in a world where turns out the New York Times and Washington Post and the other, um, you know, flagship newspapers lie all the time for reasons petty and lazy all the way to reasons treasonous and profitable. And so you no longer have an easy shortcut to say, this is true because X said it. You have to actually evaluate your truth. You have to be careful with your sources and you have to be careful with which sources you follow and which sources you believe. In cryptocurrencies, however, we do have one other measure, which is harder to see. So I can't easily tell how many people think you're a great blogger and you're telling the truth, but I can tell how many people think Bitcoin is real money. And the way I can tell that is by looking at the price, because markets tell us very clearly markets are mechanisms for aggregating information about value. That's what they do. And therefore, when it comes to cryptocurrencies, at least if you want to evaluate economic value, you can look at its exchange rate, if you like, or purchasing power. If you want to look at social value, you can look at other metrics like the velocity, how many transactions are being done. There will be as many cryptocurrencies as people at some point, and then more, just like it doesn't make any sense to ask how many cryptocurrencies will there be any more than it makes sense to ask how many bloggers can there possibly be. What is causing the extreme ups and downs? Uh, and will that level out? I mean, as you're saying, it, we're, we're sort of at the beginning of crypto. Will that level out in, say, 10, 15 years? Or, or, or what, what, is, what are your thoughts on that? Well, what, what's causing the lots of ups and downs is um, the fact that the amount of liquidity is very, very small on something that is being traded 24 hours a day in every country in the world in real time without ever pausing. But we don't have markets like that in other spheres. And as a phenomenon today, you might say, oh, wow, it was $300 billion. As a currency, that's not very exciting, uh, especially as a global currency. So it's still very small. The markets have uh, limited liquidity, and that means that just a few buyers responding to a trend or, or a hope or a piece of news can move the market a lot. And, and then if that trend reverses or a piece of bad news comes up, just a, a few panicked buyers can drive it down again. So it gets this kind of whiplash effect. Um, this has been going down though. So if you track volatility across the years, 
since 2009 to today. In fact, it's been reducing every single year uh, and very, very consistently. The bigger it gets, the more uh, stable it gets. And when we use the term liquidity, I, I like to think of it as um, maybe a small bathtub, right? So what happens when someone big jumps into that bathtub? A lot of splashing, right? Now, if that bathtub was an ocean and somebody jumps into it, what happens? Not much, right? Not much of a rip. The reason things like the US dollar are not volatile is because the amount of money flowing through that system on a daily basis and the number of independent participants who have all kinds of different motivations and timeframes um, are so varied and so large that it, it, it can't move very much. It's just a very large mass. It has a lot of inertia. Let me give you an example. If some really bad news hits today, I'm going to react very differently if I'm a speculative investor who got into it recently with a very shallow motivation of getting rich versus I'm a business person who runs a business in Bitcoin and I have payroll to make. So there's no question about whether I'm going to hold enough Bitcoin to make my payroll next month. I'm going to hold enough Bitcoin to make my payroll. And if I need to sell or buy to make my payroll, I'm going to do that regardless of what the price is. So my time preference and sensitivity to price changes is very different from that of somebody who like found out about Bitcoin last week. It's like, oh, we're going to be rich, 19,000, 16,000, oh shit, right? Um, if you have more variety of people interacting with the system for different motivations, it also uh, reduces the volatility. So no, it's not going to be like this forever. In fact, it's already getting smoother. So what would you what would you suggest people do at this point? Even though things are a little bit clunky, should people start investing in certain coins? What sort of wallets should they have? What sort of coins should they invest in? So um, investing in this technology right now or investing in the coins themselves right now is tremendously risky. Uh, and it's tremendously risky because, first of all, there's lots so figuring out what to invest in is difficult. There is a lot of volatility. Um, things that go up 80% in a year also go down 80% in a week. Um, and we've seen that happen in all of the cryptocurrencies. And those who take a long-term view can just basically sit back and say, oh, it's going to come back. You know, maybe I can get some slightly cheaper cryptocurrency coins this month because everybody's freaking out and I'm going to buck the market. You can't do that if you're overinvested. You can't do that if you're trading emotionally. You can't do that if you suddenly decided to take out a loan or put more than you can manage into this. And if that's the case, you shouldn't be investing in this, really. Honestly, you shouldn't. Um, so there's a very big risk that a lot of people who are getting in with exuberance and with this idea that things that have gone up dramatically in the last year will continue to go up. And they're not even willing to look back at a chart over the last you know, seven years of Bitcoin and notice that there's been quite a lot of this, but it's almost always followed by a, a rather scary that right after, which... If you've been through eight of those, you're like, okay, whatever. It's happening again. Chill out for a year. Do something productive. For most people, the best investment they can make is invest in skills. So when the internet crashed in 2000, people who invested in internet stocks lost a lot of money. Uh, people who invested in learning how to make um, apps, websites, web design in 2000, or iPhone apps in 2007, or for the more geekier people, the people who learned how to configure routers and install infrastructure, or the people who simply started teaching courses to teach older, less technically literate people how to use a browser. None of that went away. In fact, all of those skills continue to be useful, continue to be valuable. They allow people to develop careers that were fulfilling, that gave them freedom of, of choice and employment and variety in their life. So there's a lot to do. It's a fun place. If you go in it just for the money and you think you're gonna get rich, uh, because of this, you're not, and and then you're going to get hurt by this. So greedy people will will lose um, from this. But people who find it enriching in their lives and are curious and like technology or want to get involved in an exciting new startup space or come to it with a principled opposition to certain centralized, uh, nationalized um, systems of control and want to create a future that's less centralized, less nationalized, uh, and less controlling, 
that's always a good motivation too. So I think one of the largest takeaways from the Bitcoin conversation is this. How do we think about money and why? Indeed, the crypto conversation is at times a very philosophical one, which is why I like it. Testing the programmed notions of our centralized system and asking why we need an authority figure to tell us what has value and what doesn't. After all, crypto is fiat. Value is based on usage. Why not just use something that benefits the majority more so than the powers that be? Why pay into, why live in and value a system that doesn't value you? Cryptocurrencies allow the people to effectively opt out of the economic system that continuously holds us hostage for the malfeasance and failures of the top 1%. It's a tool that we should not underestimate nor sneer at. That being said, it's not a savior. There's no silver bullet in creating egalitarian and flat structured societies. Bitcoin is a tool. A tool with powerful potential, as we'll see in an upcoming interview on funneling cryptocurrency directly to bond payment initiatives. But Bitcoin can also be bought up by speculators, by people like the Koch brothers. And using Bitcoin won't smash racism, it won't deconstruct the military industrial complex, it won't clean our air or our water or our land. So as we stand at this precipice, looking out over an empire in decline and all that we must build for our collective futures, the crypto question is one of potential. The potential to shift economic power using technology that is increasingly accessible and uncomplicated. How can you use it to fight for justice? Something to think on. And while you're contemplating, head to Andreas's site, antonopolis.com, check that spelling, where you can find links to more videos on Bitcoin as well as his books, Mastering Bitcoin and the Internet of Money. Important to note, Mastering Bitcoin is specifically geared towards developers and techies, so choose wisely. And with that, we will wrap up this week's Dose of Dissent. Thank you so much for watching. Please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. I will be performing live spoken word and projected visuals February 3rd in DC and February 9th at Bone Shaker Books in Minneapolis. For more information and performances, please visit artkillingapathy.com. And find the other sites mentioned in this week's show in the upcoming slide or the uh, show description on YouTube. For interim updates as well as posted videos, visit us on social media. From the Devil's Den, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, donate at Occupy.com slash donate. If you'd like to donate directly to Act Out, visit Patreon.com slash Act Out. I can't hear that boots are stopping! Come on, boys! Let's get some rocks to throw! Can't stand to hear my father cry anymore. Time, time we left for you motherfuckers dead in the road. We've been begging up inch by inch. We got nowhere else to go. It's been too many years since you pushed to set my shove. I'm not a violent man, but I will kill for what I.